Insight Core Experienced, Episode 7, recorded August 21st and August 29th, 2015. Welcome to Stay Experience. Sitecore Experienced, a video podcast to showcase information related to Sitecore for the benefit of the Sitecore community. Welcome to another episode of Sitecore Experienced. I'm one of the co-hosts, Jamie Stump. And I'm Mark Survey. And we're back again. This is uh, episode 7, I believe. I think so. They all go by so fast. It feels like episode 2. Yes. Yes. Or 32, maybe, depending how you're counting. Uh, Well, this, this episode is brought to you by... I don't know what this is. What is this? Hogan's Heroes. Hogan's Heroes. Yeah, I got Going this, way back. I, You're showing yeah. your age. I don't care. Um, all, the kids, all the kids watching just went, what's Hogan's Heroes? Pretty much. That's okay. <laughs> I think everyone should watch it. It's uh, It's got the... It's got the... Um, oh, what was that show? Richard Dawson did. You know Mash. what I'm talking about? Not MASH. The um, game show. Uh, The newly, newlywed game. No, that was the other dude. I don't know, then. Family Feud. Ah. So you get to see the Family Feud guy in a sitcom. Yes. It, now it. I forget. Was Klingerman, was he in... Was that one of the characters, or is that MASH? No, nah, that's MASH. Okay. They're very similar because they're both military, but one was prisoners and others were doctors. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Enough, enough, enough. about that. Did you see Peter's tweet? <laughs> I did see Peter's tweet. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Three months, 4,000 plus developers engaged with Eat Other. I know what he meant there. We all know what he meant there. Don't get uh, Peter. You know, actually, until you pronounced it, my brain corrected it automatically. <laughs> well, you know, don't give Peter crap. That's Never. all I got to say. It's just, Never. you know, it's Eat Hother. <laughs> so, but um, no, that is a very nice stat, actually. Um, and I know, uh, I, I look at my feeds and, and I don't go in there as much as when it first appeared, but I'm tracking everything via RSS and I usually go on Feedly and and go take a look at what's going on. And yeah, people are asking questions. People are communicating, resolving. Wonderful. Absolutely It's because we drove them there, right? We told everyone to go use it. I think, I think other people had a little bit to do with that. I don't think it was us. I know. You know what I mean? I think the five pe- the five or ten people watching us consistently, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Hey, that's five or ten we drove there. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should get an award or something. Oh. <laughs> so, what do you, what's been going on in your world in Sitecore? Uh, in my current sprint, I am working to upgrade to 8.0, update 5, um, from 7.5's initial release, so... We how's, that, are, how's that going? I, it's it's going. Um, to be honest, today was the first day of the process. Um, I started the update and let it run for a while. The the actual update package piece um, that you do through the update installation wizard and it says it needs to process twelve thousand items. In about an hour and a half, it got through 800 items, Mm -hmm. and then I was in a meeting, and my computer stopped, you know, functioning because I let it sit too long, Um, so it froze at the 800th item, but man, that's going to take forever if that's the rate it goes. Do you have an intern? Do I have a what? An intern. An intern? I don't have any interns. Um, What's a great... Mm -hmm. This weekend, I have a son. Maybe I can just tell him he has to move the mouse every yeah, hour, just have right? just have him do the touchpad just go go over there every 15 minutes and go bleh, bleh, yep. bleh. right uh, or have an intern thanks. do that they love doing stuff like that interns <laughs> give me a sandwich and move my mouse yes yeah. <laughs> stare at the screen for me oh um, they love that the oh, one nothing. thing the one thing i would say while it was processing on the rather slow side i mm. did have a chance to make all the configuration changes in my source code directory because as a best practice I develop outside of the web route Mm -hmm. Um, so I was going through and making the config changes and having gone through 
other upgrades within Sightcore before. This one is kind of scary because it tells you to delete a lot. Like, basically everything that mentions web edit is deleted. And that's mm. kind of freaky because web edit is basically the page editor prior to 8.0. Um, so I'm deleting things with my fingers crossed that, <laughs> you know, it's really means to delete it. Who needs that page editor anyway? <laughs> uh, you can't say that. I know. I can. Well, wipe I just the, did. Wipe that from the record. No, 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 no. That's, that's going to roll right through. But it was a very facetious comment on my part because that yes. damn thing is Yeah, wonderful. if you want to use Sitecore, you need it. You should just do it anyway, even if you don't want to. Yes. Why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to be one of the cool kids? <laughs> well, good. Uh, for me, I'm still head, knee, deep, head, knee, toes, and speak. Um, yes, you've had quite the tweets. Quite the battle still. Uh, you know, I love it. I hate it. I love it. You know what I mean? Um, I think I'm more on the love side of it now. I think the hate is behind me. That's good. Um, progress? Progress. I just got to watch what I say about progress. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to cover my words. I just don't want to give away what I've been diving into for the last four months. So, um, eventually I'm going to blog. I've been saying that now for like three weeks on Speak. We got a, a, a Speak... Um, thing to talk about today in community so uh we'll, I'll, I'll kind of throw my two cents in on, on my experience a little bit then i'm not going to take uh, that thunder away but it has been challenging and um i think there's some good stuff coming hopefully i think i found a limitation in the list control um that i'm hoping to work around somehow it's into Sitecore as a potential, we won't call it a fix because it's really not broke. It's more of an enhancement to be able to embed controls in the list control properly and have those events bubble up, which I couldn't do. Um, not cleanly anyway, so I got to come back and see how clean I can do it at some point. So that, you know, since we want to talk about this some more at some point, should we get cracking? Let's do it. Community happenings, man. Here we go. All right, so in community happenings, we're going to start off with uh, some recent news. Sitecore was named a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for web content management. This is the sixth year in a row it's a leader. They're a top um, bubble, man. Look at that. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, though, it's it's exciting and it's very good for Sitecore, but I'll be honest, at this point, that's my expectation. Um the day, you know, the year they're not there anymore is the year I start to get worried. Um, it, it just, I guess when you've done it for six years, and, I, and keep it up, Sitecore, by no means stop. I'm just saying that that's now my expectation, is every year this report comes out, of course they're going to be a leader. I get what you're saying. Um, no, I'm happy. I mean, this just tells us that we're all um, working on a damn good platform. Yes, which again, I, I guess I just feel we are all well aware of that, and and we expect you know, we expect this year from year. It doesn't mean I I'm not trying to diminish their accomplishments. They are oh, doing no. superb work, but you're just trying to push their accomplishments until you make them crack. Is what you're trying to do, Jamie? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Now, Psycho, well, you did a great job. Congratulations. But next year. <laughs> Next year, next year I on. want you off that chart up the at the top, right? Next year, we're gonna make history, Psychor. <laughs> <laughs> no, congratulations, Psychor. Yes. Um, congratulations, partners, developers, marketers, and other lovely people and invited guests. Definitely. Probably huh? all I should have said. Yeah. All right, so moving on, uh, SugCon, and see, see, now I'm gonna follow this up with some more. Um, There's some pretty so faces the, here. Y yes. So SugCon, the the speakers have come out, and I think this is the complete list of speakers, and their topics are out there. Um, and and I'll be uh, I'll be honest about this. 
I look at the schedule and I think, man, this is what Symposium last year should have included. Um, it's got people from Sitecore who are talking about their own product. That's awesome. I think we had a lot of that at last year's symposium. But it's also got people from outside of Sitecore who work with the product every day in real-world scenarios giving their accounts of things and sort of sharing their expertise. And I think that is what Symposium last year was lacking. Um... And, you know, I I think it, it missed having that. I like that we're learned, you know, at SugCon, there's going to be presentations that the people in attendance can go back to their own companies or their own clients and start implementing things they hear about that next day. Um, I like that aspect of this show. Um, so it, it really looks like a, a great... Um, list of speakers some great topics you know i think when i saw it i i I am you and said wow it's like a who's who of mvps um so yeah i think everyone who's attending that will certainly uh get their get their money's worth and and be enlightened from some very brilliant people yeah i mean there's good topics i mean we just slowly page through all of them i hope everybody read as 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 we were going through um (laughs) if you didn't there's the pause button what's that the pause button if you couldn't catch it you pause right oh that's right we're video (laughs) um you know we've had a lot of those folks have been guests on this show um some of those people don't realize it yet, but they'll be guests on this show in the future. Whether they like it or not, we will hunt them down and, and get them. Um, there's only one thing I noticed, Jamie. Uh-oh. I think we're missing the ladies out of this group. Yeah. Well. Am I wrong? Yeah. Did I miss somebody? I don't think you have, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 one thing I had to talk with somebody about about um, the whole women in IT, right? And and the few numbers that there are. Um, I'm I'm just saying. I notice these things now. I kind of got scolded in a way, which is good. I needed to be scolded. What I picked out. Um, this tweet came out, which caught my eye. Now, the other things that I've been doing when I'm not just submerging myself in a bathtub of speak is submerging myself in a bathtub of serialization. And this caught my eye, and there was some feedback um, back and forth uh, that kind of went into stuff. And the stuff that it went into essentially was, you know, hey, this JSON data provider's out. This allows you to put tree content, serialized content, and JSON. But it also led to this, because Cam wrote about this back in July. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we did, I don't know if we remember if we showcased this or not. I know Cam, episode one guest, um, at that time it was the same company with a different name. Now it's Connective DX. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing here, he talks about um, JSON and serialization and some of the headaches really um, he talks about multi-field and, and the collisions that happen and manual merges that need to happen, you know, based on two people making changes. He's yep. also talked about automatic um, changing of fields that we necessarily may not care about in an audience. Um, he points out primarily revision, updated by, and updated uh, for mm-hmm. the site core, core template fields. And instead of using JSON, he talks about using YAML. Um, to, to get around some of the, the things and how it's slower, but, you know, it has its benefits. So I yep. think they're definitely worth a read. Um, even if you're not that much into serialization and you need things to do, you should be reading this stuff. Yeah, it never hurts to be educated because you might not need it today, but in three weeks it might come up and rear its head. Yeah, and just, you know, one day I'll be educated. The whole world will be in trouble. <laughs> so, the final thing that I found, and of course, I pop into the middle of it. <laughs> this tidbit, like I said, I've been in a bathtub to speak. So, 
you know, there, there's really kind of a core section of, of blogs. And um, uh, Goran, uh, listen, listen here. Hopefully, Goran, I'm, I'm pronouncing your, your name right. Otherwise, you may mock me at whim on Twitter. Um, but here's a Google Map component done in Speak. Very good example. Pretty intense from a, a use of, of components and, and layouts. But he really kind of goes through the process. One thing I would add in here, um, these are all almost mandatory reading if you're going to do speak. Julia Gavrilova has an excellent blog post that I put up here on the screen that helped me out tremendously. I happen to work with Julia as well, so I got to pick her brain a little bit. Um, definitely saved my butt a couple times. So I would ever recommend looking at that as well. Here, you know, we were talking about, you know, just basically what this thing looks like. And I wanted to just show the amount of work put into this. There's a the JS. But you can tell from a component standpoint, if we can get through all that good code, you know, that's a lot going on, man. Mm-hmm. Welcome to speak. Welcome to speak. <laughs> and uh, it is not for the faint of heart. You will cry. <laughs> you will be in a fetal position for a while, but if you can just work your way out of the crying in the fetal position. Um, it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. So um, this is an excellent article um, that needs to be up there with the other ones now as far as speak reference. So um, excellent, excellent job. Marketplace. So... Um, all the cool stuff going on, all the cool kids are playing with. Again, this is the hardest part of what we do, Jamie, because... Because there's not an RSS feed. Oh, there's no not. And so I got to go through that. I go through this by hand. Every every single... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a sob story here. Every <laughs> single marketplace application module I go through. <laughs> and I look at them all. <laughs> And I go, yep, yeah, this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Rocky. No, I just, I just, uh, I go grab. Hey, that one looks good. <laughs> Get, we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we got here, the Robinses, and I'm going to guess, I'm going to go out on a limb. These guys know each other. <laughs> gonna go out on a limb on that one. Maybe I, <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb. They know each other. They have this nice little module for eight that allows you to display basically respective all the all the data sources for components related to an item in Sitecore. Um, I'm gonna show screens because that's what we do here, yep. and they have them. You know, which I've obviously helped. Um, so this is what this bad boy looks like. You can look through and go, hey, look at me, look at me. And then you can actually see in a speak listing, it looks like, basically what's being used. Um, this is nice. I like this. That is use, nice. Use it. It's only, you know, here's the problem I have with it. I got four out of five. I didn't, I, I wasn't the one rating. I, I want to make that very, very clear. I would, uh, I always, you know, do the five. <laughs> Just saying. So, uh, fairly recent from a release date. So, um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. What was yeah. your problem with it? I didn't. I didn't do this rating. I didn't do the rating. I don't have a problem with it. I'm good. It'd be five. Here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> uh, wait, 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 wait. Are I you... gotta log in. <laughs> I'm not doing. That. Wait, I'm confused. Are you saying that you are the rating, no, but it was a mistake I, that you picked no, four? No, no, no. I did not rate this. I'm saying it has one rating of four, and that seems evil. So you're upset at the person who did the rating and I'm, not I'm, upset I'm, that it has a rating of four, because a rating of four is still pretty good. Uh, it should be five, dude. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if I'm upset with the person because I don't know who did it. <laughs> I may you know say, what would be helpful? I may say something I would regret to that person if I said, you know, this person, but I would use wow. different words, only gave well, it a four. Yes, but so here's, if you're not going to give it a five, 
perhaps a comment oh. as to why it could be improved to get a five could be warranted. I'm saying the Robins guys, fetal position, crying. <laughs> he got one rating with a four. It's, it's like, what didn't we do? Why not a five? Like you said, uh, well, you know, that screen could have been in different colors. Four. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, maybe it's only a four because it only works with Sitecore 8. And uh, the person who wants to use it is on a lesser version of Sitecore. That is why you're the, the sane voice yes. out of the pair yeah. of us. You know what I'm scared of? I'm scared of people seeing this section of our podcast, all five or ten of them, mm -hmm. and going out and rating our module at like a two now, just to see you lose your mind. Well, I, I don't even look at our module. <laughs> because even, because you so, already have it installed, right? Listen, and you I, don't need it. I've gone through all nine million of these on the marketplace. <laughs> and ours is just a blip in the road, man. Oh, it's true. It's only a blip in the road. Um, yeah, we got a really good our... comment this week for oh, our module, we? though. Cool. And so we have something to think about maybe trying to incorporate in the near future. I don't mm -hmm. know if we'll have time, but we'll think about it. I didn't even go look. That Seriously, I don't look at it. I should do that. I'm, <laughs> I'm the terrible person. I'm a, I'm a tragic uh, human being. I guess I'm just more of the egomaniac that I need to... You know, no, you're, you're, do, you're doing the right things. I do all the wrong things. That's why this works so well. Um, <laughs> help the Robins. Out. Rate this thing. Rate it. Five. Unless you really now feel see, that it needs to be a four. See, I... Does, we better get off this subject. I, really I haven't paid enough attention here. If somebody rates it a five, it'll now have two ratings. One of a four and one of a five. Will the images show four and a half? Is 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 marketplace that advanced to do like partial stars? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, you know what? The podcast is going to be a little longer, but you know what? <laughs> this is well worth it. You can't get better than this, kids. This I gotta... the, we we are off the rails. We are. <laughs> we are cooking with gas, kids. Oh, wait, i got to go get the super secret keyboard. Hold on. <laughs> you know somebody's going to watch this and figure out your password. I don't care. Yeah, I do, actually. Don't screw with my psycho password, hackers. <laughs> Here it comes. Watch it be in plain text. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> now watch something come up. Like, hey, you have a comment. <laughs> Oh, there I, oh, look at that. There's that notification. I bet you that's the comment. Um, here we go. Hey! See that? Now it proves that I didn't leave that one rating. It won me. <sighs> yeah, I'm all, I'm see? All up that. Hey, Sidecore, I think you need partial stars. What's wrong with that? Why are you taking this away from them? Why are you, why are you making the Robinses go back to the fetal position? They got a five. Let's let it go. We, everyone's happy here but you. Okay. <laughs> you want an RSS the, feed for Marketplace. I, I want partial stars. You know what? I'm going to go through every Marketplace module and I'm going to rate it a 5 until I get an RSS feed. Oh. I'm not kidding. <laughs> you're, you're holding them hostage. Every every five days you're going to mark a new one 5. <laughs> Do you know what's going to happen? If I even started doing that to the first 20... They'd shut my account down. <laughs> now, I, you know, I felt this deserved a five. It got a five for me. It is now a five. Boom. Hey, let's see what's going on. So, okay. I know we should be moving see, on. Oh, look at this. You commented this, on. Yes, I responded hey. to the comment. But now, but now wait. I'm right. still on this whole star thing. <laughs> so, yeah. so it went from four to five. Because what if, what if the first rating would have been a one? And this, this now has nothing to do with this actual module, right? Now we're just talking <laughs> hypothetically about Marketplace. If it was a 1 and you put in a 5, would the result be a 3? I don't know. No, it goes down to a 3. That's what you said. People weren't paying attention like me. Okay, so so a 4 and a 1 equals a 3. <laughs> 
Good math there, partial, isn't it? We need we we need some partial stars, like Gor. Hey, they don't All have right. to worry we about. We need it. to move on. The segment. The segments. You know, the now you got me checking my messages at the same time, right? Um, Dave, Lucas, and Wesley, you guys are awesome. I don't care what everybody else says about you. You guys are all right in my book. Um, Jamie, you too. You're also awesome. Oh, that's you. All right. Uh, yeah, you're right. We gotta... Jamie's probably less awesome I don't than know. the other guys. You left a comment. Dun, 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 dun. I was actually responding to, to Wesley's Dave? comment. Was it Wesley or Dave? Because Dave commented. Oh. Wesley just recommended. Oh, well, then maybe it was Dave's comment. Oh. I don't know. Let's... You well, want to pull it up? You want to you want to do something on the fly here? Yeah, why not? Now, see, you're logged in. This might be dangerous. Well, it'll probably go back to the login screen and then where I'll be hosed for the rest of the segment. <laughs> I better go to the other one. Quick. Let's go to the other one real quick. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. What'd you find, Jamie? <laughs> I can't. All right, here we go. Yeah. So, Site card code generator. Um, so this is from Robin Hermussen, um, and it's basically a code generator. I think you got that from the name. Look, it's got a five star one rating mark. I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do it. I, not that I this, wouldn't. I just so didn't. I didn't do it. The purpose of this is if people are using glass, I happen to use glass for most of my projects. Um, Glass is not a code generator, um, which means after you build your templates, you're going out and you're building your objects that'll map the templates into them. That Glass will do that for you. Um, you could have TDS do some really cool code generation for you. You could opt to use Unicorn, um, which Cam demoed to us in episode one, mm -hmm. which has some code gen. But if you are using Glass and you don't use TDS for whatever reason, uh, Robin has written a code generator here that will do some code gen for you with those technologies. And, and you know, the nice thing I like about this is that he does decorate it with the Glass Mapper attributes. So if you are using Glass, it'll kind of automatically pipe in there. I haven't used, a, I haven't done anything with T4 template in a, in a long time, at least create one. Um utilizing that's a whole different thing but so that's i like that mm -hmm. i like that um should i rate i didn't use this one i feel really weird rating it but i'm not yeah you know he's already got five stars he doesn't so. need your autocorrect magic but maybe this is the first one you can hold hostage till you get the rss feed you're looking for don't make me do two ratings no <laughs> once i use it i'll give it back to five okay that's how that rolls even if it stunk, you would still give it a five. No, no, absolutely. Not. Well, yeah. I mean, if you hold hostage, absolutely. Why would I give it a stinky rating when I'm holding people hostage for an RSS feed? You know, this is not a difficult thing. RSS feed, please. All right, no. Um, Maybe you should rate one. An RSS feed? Yeah, there you, for, there you go. For Marketplace? Yeah. It, if you're using Sitecore, ain't that pretty easy just to go feed? <laughs> uh, that's what the kids say. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna we're gonna go back to this really quick because it still looks like it's still loading. It's still that, spinning. That means you're definitely hitting. Oh the, uh... no, it's gonna happen again. <laughs> You got to put in. Uh, so there's a trick to this. You got to put in the bar SC mode equals normal. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, it worked. Look it that. worked. Quick scroll down to the comments. Um, Everything I said look, about Psycho look, earlier look, we is have awesome. One, look, we have one four-star rating. What? <laughs> Damn it. Mm. All right. Works perfectly on Psycho Rate. Thanks. You're awesome. There's Dave. Dave, let me just wonder what means to the rendering. The orphan child rendering is not removed from the presentation. Ah. We'll find a solution. Did you do this already, Jamie, and didn't tell me about it? I have not found a solution, no. Okay, um, we'll have but to I talk. do, I do believe that's kind of standard Sitecore behavior. Even with a regular placeholder, I don't think it removes child. 
Um, and trust me, I've I've been bit by that where mm -hmm. you remove a container, you add a different container, and all of a sudden these things pop up inside of it, and you're like, oh, where did these come from? Um, so yeah, that it's definitely a good request. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see if we can get it in when we have some time. I think it's a great idea, actually. Yep. In all seriousness, but then I got to come back up here and go, boom, done. Ooh, ooh you shouldn't be able to do that. I just did. I raided my own module. Hmm. Is that well? Think about it. If I'm really proud, can't I flaunt it? Yeah, but every time you see, you're in some pseudo logged in, but not really logged in state right now. Oh, come on now. No, I, I, we. Well, we, now we, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I get to see it even. Three or Didn't... four. Uh, I'm confused. I almost said I clicked it. You know what? Uh, yes. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to work either. Well, and mm -hmm. here's the <laughs> here's the real problem. Mm -hmm. You can't undo your clicking. Like, no, there's can't. no like, whoops! I clicked this by accident. Somebody will come in, just out of pure hate, and give it a one, bringing us back down. Yep. You know what? I'm going to be fair. Somebody gave us a four. I'm going to give us a four. I thought you didn't do that, Mark. There. <laughs> you think oh, we've been... This segment over. <laughs> the people want us to move on. Yeah, I think, I think it's time. <laughs> Our guest today is Jared Smith. Jared is a developer who for the past 10 years has been in the digital agency space doing full stack web development and kiosk applications. Jared, his wife, and their four-year-old twins live in the suburbs of Milwaukee, which has also become my adopted hometown. When Jared is not soaking up Psycho or fixing broken toys and taking off training wheels, Jared is a hobbyist woodworker, Nintendo enthusiast, and plays his bass guitar among other instruments. Jared! Welcome. Thank Welcome, Chair. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Perfect. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about um, kind of a start-to-finish workflow with Sitecore and some other tooling to get your code out to production. Cool. Very cool. Awesome. So, pretty much, you're, are you talking more development lifecycle to delivery or kind of from Sitecore yeah. to delivery kind of thing? <laughs> From develop, development life cycle in, in projects that involve Sitecore. Very cool. Cool. All right, man, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks. Uh, so I titled uh, the title of this talk, Making a Sitecore Sandwich, One Team's Tasty Workflow. Just kind of representing there's lots of parts uh, to this process. Um, as Mark said, uh, <clears throat> I've worked with Sitecore for a little while. Um, I'm a senior interface developer at Aurora Healthcare currently on the, our digital experience team. Uh, that's a team that was formed about a little over a year ago. And this whole process has been evolved and built out from scratch. So we've gone through lots of different uh, trials and tribulations figuring out something that works for our team. Um, so I have a blog that, because I have kids, I don't get updated too recently, but I do have some stuff on there that hopefully some will find useful. Uh, and also I'm on LinkedIn there too. So Aurora, for people people outside of Milwaukee, Jared, not like you and I, uh, Aurora Healthcare is, I believe, headquartered in Milwaukee, and they are the, the state's principal largest employer, I believe, correct? Indeed. Uh, yeah, we have a little over, I think, 31,000 employees overall. Yeah, so wow. not, not small. <laughs> no, not at all. No, and, and our group is probably about, at the most, 10 or 12 or so people. Um, we're separate from the IT group, which is like roughly 800 to, su to support the whole infrastructure. So we're strictly the public facing web properties. Okay, so we're, de we're definitely talking enterprise <laughs> level, enterprise integration. Uh, you're not with an IT, I believe, when we talked about, you're with the, the marketing department. More Marketing communications, yeah. yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I am Sitecore certified, not an MVP, but I was certified on version 6.5 and then recertified on version 7. I've worked with both web forms and uh, MVC solutions in Sitecore, so I've had a good breadth of experience with it. Um, so in general, with any 
uh, project workflow. You've got you're writing your code and creating for Sitecore. You create your Sitecore items to go with it. Um, like for MVC, you have your rendering definitions. Then when that's all ready, you deploy it to an environment and you publish it for the world to enjoy. So it's a pretty simple process in theory, right? But uh, in our case, everything's hosted out in the Azure cloud. So that adds a whole another level of complexity uh, to the to the equation. Um, so then this process is repeated every time you have a new new feature release. <clears throat> we start out uh, on the code end. Uh, we're a .NET group, so we use Visual Studio for our development. Uh, and as many Sitecore developers are familiar, we have site use Sitecore Rocks, uh, also uh, TDS, Team Development for Sitecore, which just serializes the Sitecore database items, so you can version those along with your code, which is quite handy. Uh, we use a number of <clears throat> Visual Studio extensions as well. Uh, Slow Cheetah for uh, XML config transforms, and you can preview what those would look like uh, within Visual Studio as well. Uh, Trevor, which is a handy little tool, it just speeds up the process of attaching to the W3WP process for debugging. Um, and then the last two there, uh, Task Runner Explorer, <coughs> excuse me, and Grunt Launcher, are uh, front-end tooling uh, pieces. Since I'm specifically in the last few years been uh, front-end focus, uh, we've got some nice automation uh, and integration pieces there as well. Uh, we use uh, Ruby and Node.js, which are installed for some of the front-end tooling. So we use uh, on Ruby, we run Compass, which is a preprocessor for CSS, and we specifically uh, use SAS, which is a, a style of uh, pre CSS preprocessing. And then on top of Node.js, we use a tool called Grunt, which is simply just a task runner. So you have a JSON file that you can configure uh, to run any number of, of uh, tools that you install on top of Node. So we use Grunt for our JavaScript um, concatenation, minification, uglification, all the ications, and uh, <laughs> and code hinting and things for uh, qual you know quick checks if there are syntax errors and such. <clears throat> okay, the is Compass kind of like Gulp in a way? Um, Compass is a bunch of mix-ins for. Um, just for useful functions, basically. So it Compass itself will compile SAS into CSS output. Um, and I'm not super familiar with with uh, with Compass and Ruby. I've used it just initially from other people would have set it up and I would have just used it. Um, so there are other options. Node has uh, CSS precompilers as well for SAS, but they're not as as full featured. So we chose our team chose to use uh, Ruby and Compass. Compass seems to have a larger community around it as well. So so we start out in Visual Studio, and there is some resources here, and I will touch on this again and do a short demo uh, at the end of my talk. <coughs> uh, but Scott Hanselman has a really good blog post uh, showing this integration in Visual Studio, which is what we referred to when we implemented all of these uh, these pieces. So after we write our code and create our local Sitecore items and we package all of that up, we want to get it out to an environment. So uh, we use GitHub um, and the Git version control. <clears throat> and what we do is we have three branches for different environments. We have dev, QA, and master or production. And so uh, we use a tool called Team City for our code builds and it monitors those three branches. So whenever we check in code and push to that remote repository, Team City will say, hey, there's new code, and it'll build it. Uh, if something breaks, it'll notify us. If it succeeds, it notifies us. So that is monitoring Git. Then it'll ship it over to Octopus Deploy, which is um, a program that lets you configure um, different endpoints to send code to. Like you could have any number of servers. They call them tentacles, which is each tentacle points at, a, at an endpoint basically for where you want to send off your code to. Um, in our case, the endpoint to ship the code is out in Azure IaaS uh, and ultimately out in PaaS. And so I'll be talking through each of these, these pieces. So uh, Team City. So this, this step is automated <clears throat> and it, Team City will monitor our Git uh, repo, each of the three branches I mentioned, and it will run unit tests. Uh, any anything we want to have it run, it'll run. You configure it to run any number of steps. You can run PowerShell scripts as a step. 
So we do our, we install Grunt uh, on top of Node and Ruby on that server as well. So it will actually do the JavaScript um, minification, etc., and CSS compilation on the server. So if that breaks, it'll also fail the build. Um, and it will take all of these things and package it into a, a NuGet package. And so then that gets sent out to the Octopus deploy server and it sits there and waits for us to, to interact with it at the next step. Uh, we also, as I said, if it fails, we get notified and we go in and figure out what broke it. So you're not really doing an auto deploy out to the tentacles right away. You're making sure your build is complete and you're triggering that next step, correct? Did I understand that correctly? That's correct. So the, when we have a feature we want to check in, we just push it out to Git and it goes through all of this building and then sits as a NuGet package on Octopus Deploy and just waits for us to do something for it. <clears throat> so Jared, um, I'm in an environment that's that's actually pretty similar to you. Um, I start in TFS, then have Team City doing builds, then use Octopus Deploy to push out to um, AWS IAS. Um, and so, do you... Um, for the actual native Sitecore files, are they included in your Git <coughs> repository, or are they excluded from your source control? Good question, Jamie. They are not included in our Git uh, source code. So okay. we set everything up um, for multi-site. So each our code base is one for one one site currently. So our solution has um, one web project in it at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that that's the code that gets deployed out there and everything is is pushed out into folders specific to that site more or less namespaced mm -hmm. okay so that's that is where we would slightly differ um we took the approach of actually putting all of our site core files into um our source control <coughs> for the ability then to basically deploy at will to a new server um, if we decide to take down one server and, and start a different web server, we just hit deploy through Octopus. So you're essentially redeploying Sitecore through your deploy process versus like a tool like Sim. That's correct. I um and and I kind of fought against that, um, but was overruled by some other architects within the company. Um, but the you know. The nice thing to hear from this is you can basically go either way, right? Both ways mm -hmm. will eventually work for you. Yep. Yeah, and I think, um, and I, I'm not an Azure expert, and I wasn't involved in all of the um, scripting and spinning up of the, the um, IaaS VMs and such, but um, I understand that most of it is, is script-based script, script based or scripting for spinning those things up, at least for, I know the PaaS side is. Um, so I'm not. Do you? What is the the lead time, or how long does it take to spin up a whole new um, install of Sitecore for you guys? Well, so our deployment process can take um, about ten minutes per front end server, um, including the Sitecore files, but not necessarily including any URL verification. Um, so we're currently on. We're, we're, we just upgraded to Sitecore 8, and anyone who's worked with Sitecore 8 knows that after your first build, um, <coughs> IIS can take a really long time to come back, warm up the DLLs or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so if you add in all that time, you're easily getting to like 20 minutes of deployment. Okay. I should, I should uh, preface all of this with, we're on Sitecore version 7.5, mainly because at the time that we um, our team got all built and we were starting to flesh all of this out, um, the Azure module, which I'll be talking about for uh, seven, for version 8, was not out yet. And 8 was still coming out while we were still figuring out what we were doing with 7.5. So um, to have support and help from Sitecore support, we stayed with 7.5 um, just to manage risk there. And we know there are some issues with 8 that have come up kind of off and on over time as well as they're improving the product. So, um, you know... So that's, that's another thing to note. So we're on version 7.5 right now. Uh, so that, that server's got Octopus Deploy and a write-only private NuGet server. Uh, that's where the, all our packages are sitting. Um, it creates a new release. So when we have a build in Team City, it assigns it a build number, um, like, you know, 1.0.0. I don't know, 568. And the Octopus Deploy will have a new release with the same version tagged in it. 
uh, then we there are steps in Octopus Deploy, much like Team City, that will run when you say, okay, uh, promote to a particular environment. So <clears throat> that will run PowerShell scripts that will <coughs> take um, the TDS packages and put those out on the destination server. It'll also, we have a tool called New Relic, which will, uh, that provides server monitoring out in the cloud, uh, which is a really powerful tool. If you have, aren't familiar with it, it's newrelic.com. It's been really, really helpful in getting um, statistics and um, usage data for servers. You get JavaScript errors. So, I mean, it, it picks up almost everything. Uh, so we put a marker on the timeline in New Relic through a curl request um, to say, here's a new, a new release. And so we can filter by that release date and everything past it. So that's been helpful. Uh, we also send notifications on success or failure um, through email. And you can also have plugins for different chat clients. It's mainly, it gives you analytics like, you know, a uh, number of, like generic numbers, like n number of visits, unique, unique visitors, um, shows you number of requests, what pages were hit. Um, you can drill down to, um, it'll sh show you the thrown exceptions if something errors out. So it keeps all the historic information. So uh, we've found a number of performance things that we've fixed because of having New Relic in place. Okay. So it's been, it's been quite helpful. Excellent. So at this point, it's out in Octopus Deploy, and we are ready to throw it out up into the sky, into the cloud. So the next step, it goes into Azure IaaS to a deployment virtual machine. Um, and that step is the push button with an octopus. You say promote it, and it'll go to that environment. So it takes all your deployed code. Uh, and for us, the process isn't fully automated yet, unfortunately, so it takes a lot more time. But our process at the moment the deployment server gets the code. We install the TDS items <clears throat> manually in the installation wizard uh, admin page, um, which can take some time. And then once that's all completed, we'll use the Sitecore Azure module to kick off uh, the deployment to the web farms. For I think for, for us in Wisconsin, it's I think one of the Midwest central uh, farms. So <clears throat> that the deployment itself um, can take around 30 minutes or so from IaaS out to PaaS. Um, we usually you know, do smart publishing for changed items. So once we deploy or publish it through the Azure module out to PaaS, um, it takes, it runs all of our config transforms and things. So the like uh, Azure module has, and this is one of the kind of shortcomings is you have manual configuration transforms in um, what I assume are, are template fields within that module. So you copy and paste your transforms. So they're not version controlled. Um, there are ways to do that, and I believe some of our developers are, are looking into that. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> pushing out to PaaS, it'll deploy all of our files and apply transformations out to our CM server. Um, and then, oh, I'm sorry. This this is the step where we it puts the, the uh, update files out there for TDS, and we install them in that in that CM environment in production. And so that's a manual step, like I mentioned. Okay. And then, so then at that point, in PaaS, on this, our CM server, we publish everything out to, to CD, and then everything is live. Um, so, let's see. So that process, end to end, if you're super attentive to watching progress bars all the time, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the caveat, right? Um, it's like, it's probably two hours ish. So it's a long period of time. Um, but if you think about it, uh, the PaaS servers, I mean, it's it spins up a brand new machine, mm -hmm. right, with, with brand new codes, which is pretty amazing to see where technology has come over time that, that you know, that's all just scripted. Um, so they'll, we'll never get past just the, at least that half hour for PaaS of spinning up machines, um, but we can work on automating a lot of um, the manual steps. Mm -hmm. And so the future state, where we want this to end up and what we're working toward now <clears throat> Um, we want to automate as much as possible. Now, for those um, watching, uh, Sitecore developers that are looking at doing this on Azure, um, there's a website, sitecoreonazure.net. <coughs> it gives some useful information of op options and things. Um, there are th basically three ways that you can deploy out to the cloud. There's through Visual Studio, um, publishing to a cloud endpoint um, on VMs. There's uh, the Azure module, uh, which you install in Sitecore. And then PowerShell scripting everything, which 
is a very arduous um, choice, but it has, offers the most flexibility. Um, so we're looking at that option. Um, we have other tools in place like Coveo for searching and things. So there's other pieces that the Azure module doesn't know about um, that we're trying to coordinate with the deploys. So um, there's also other additional tools. Cycle Courier lets you, if there's n hardly any changes to Cycle items in your TDS package, still has everything, it will do a diff and create you uh, a zip package file with just the changed items, which is a hu huge deal with your install time for the package. Um, additionally, there's another tool called Sitecore Ship, which will take it and through an HTTP request can hit your endpoint and install it for you. And there's some, I think, some security things you set up so that that's more secure. Um, but those would speed up our deployment time quite a bit because we'd probably spend uh, five to ten minutes on just a lot of those in, those package installs. They can take quite a while. <clears throat> so what we've come down to is probably three ideal steps <coughs> that we're looking at. We kick off the initial team city build by checking uh, code into um, our uh, environment branch in GitHub. Then we would click the button in Octopus Deploy to say put it put it out there to that environment. Once it gets there, um, the ideal that that automated process between saying okay Octopus deploy this thing, it ideally would end up at um, the this, this staging slot in Azure in the PaaS environment, so we could do smoke testing there before we uh, swap it with actual production CD. So we do some smoke testing there, and then it'd be published out to the actual uh, instance that's live. Um, so we have a quality assurance uh, analyst on our team who does all, a lot of the, uh, well, the testing for our team. Um, so that step in the middle of final smoke testing is really important. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at for kind of the ideal workflow. Okay, and how many developers uh, go through the process uh, and to check in? And I, I guess what I'm getting at really is, how often is this process, you know, run? To, and, and when you get to future state, is that going to change? Are you looking at streamlining, <coughs> kind of your inputs yeah, and your outputs? Yeah, um, we've got. Let's see, for active developers that are checking in code, um, let's see, probably eight, eight to ten okay. around that. And we, d we probably on average do a production deploy at least once a week, maybe twice a week, depending on if there's you know high, high priority things. Um, the ideal state would be to publish, you know, the smaller the changes, and this is kind of goes into my next, segues into my next slide here. Um, keeping releases as small as possible limits your risk, right? So there's less to test, there's less potential impact in other things. Uh, and if you have to roll back, there's less to mess with. So if we can, pare down that develop that deployment time it allows us the ability to deploy much more often with smaller releases rather than you know waiting till you get six features or bug fixes in together and deploying that all because of the big you know time impact so ultimately we'd like to deploy more often with smaller um, changes okay um, this process has been a you know a year like a year and a half in the making we're still revising it working on automation um, so some of the stuff we've learned, a lot of the detail of implementing solutions and paths on, on Sitecore on Azure is largely undocumented from what we found for a lot of specific things. Um, and we've had calls with Sitecore themselves who have admitted that there haven't been a lot of companies that are doing Azure in paths specifically. I as for sure, because VMs are, you know, you can log right into it and tweak stuff, but paths is all unmanaged, so yep. there's, it's a lot more difficult to get get right, you know, and, and harder to kind of fix. Um, so we've had to do a lot of trial and error to learn this stuff. Um, and we've been lucky to have some really good really good um, people on our team who've had a lot of good experience with uh, Azure to be familiar with, with the infrastructure side. So they, that's been tremendously helpful to have somebody in-house to help with that. Um, the Azure module, as I said, doesn't really help out much with you know third-party things to get integrated in it so it just it knows about site core and that's kind of its thing mm -hmm. which makes you know some sense um, and that the modules made mainly made for like business users that don't do tons of customization um, which is why we're kind of looking at, at a PowerShell scripting as an as an uh, potential option um, you're never gonna get past the overhead of spinning up new PaaS instances it's just the nature of the beast um, it's, I think it's well worth the cost though, given kind of not having to install patches and managing those servers is, is nice to not worry about. 
And, and I assume there, too, even with that 30 minutes, you're not really experiencing... I mean, you're building a brand new server from scratch. Your other one's existing. When this one's ready to go, you pull the other one down. So you're not really losing anything except your content taking 30 minutes to get out there. Right. From our, from the developer's best perspective, you're just waiting for your change to go live to check it, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, from the public's perspective, there's no difference. It's, it's old, old stuff, and all of a sudden it's new. Yep. Um, and we've got a number of low balance servers, so one will get updated, it'll pull one down, so it's a progressive thing. Um, so another thing to note that uh, Microsoft applies patches to the PaaS servers um, whenever they want to. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're not going to notify the however many thousands or millions of <laughs> users, you know, sure. um, through an email blast. So. Um, we ha and we also have a tool called PagerDuty. It alerts us through uh, New Relic when a server's unresponsive or something. So when it goes through rolling updates, somebody will get blasted at three in the morning with alerts, you know, because Microsoft's updating PaaS with sites not down, but servers are being rebooted. So sure, sure. That that was an interesting shock. We're like, oh, what happened last night, everyone? Oh, yeah, Microsoft wanted to update stuff. Awesome. <laughs> Which it is awesome, but it was confusing for a bit till we you, realized what it was. Yeah, you'd yes. think they... Email blast is probably a little much, right? Because we all know how much we check our email all the time. Um, you know, but <coughs> some kind of... Just a little bit of maintenance window might help there, right? Yeah, the first one that happened when we first got up and running, we got notified because we were already in, in uh, contact with Microsoft on it, with infrastructure questions and things. Because we uh, were fortunate to have a premier support contract with them so we've gotten to work closely with their engineers which has been really really cool experience so we knew about the first window that they were going to be rolling updates uh ones after that not so much <laughs> so those were kind of surprises yeah um but but i mean the platform did what it was supposed to nothing went down so excellent um uh, another thing is automation is your friend like i said we're working on automating more of the process um we all hear that sort of like the golden nugget to aspire to, you know, have everything automated, frees you up to do more development. It really is true. Um, so the more you can automate, the faster deployments go, the less you worry about it. You don't have to handhold things and leave things open to human error. Like, oh, I forgot to click this one button in this part of the process. You know, so you have to start over. None of that. So automation is kind of our, our goal. Um, keeping releases small, like I said, and like I also mentioned, having vendor support, Microsoft support, Sitecore support, I mean, all of that's really helpful, especially when a lot of us, I mean, we were all new to Coveo, um, and Coveo has been a great, great help throughout this. Um, even just with, with good faith help without having a contract in place, they've been very responsive and helpful. Hmm. Um, so, <clears throat> and sharing with others, obviously. The Sitecore community is a pretty tight community. You know, we, we love the platform, we love learning and expanding it. Um, We've had we've had uh, conference calls with other other companies that have implemented solutions with Sitecore, gotten feedback, given uh, you know just kind of share a sharing session. Okay. Um, so that's been super helpful as well. And I know um, I was at the Mike, the Milwaukee Sitecore meetup when John West was uh, coming through, mm -hmm. and you know sharing in the community was really what's on kind of his heart and vision, right? That he wants to kind of have a legacy of. So you know that's been really helpful and something that we've seen really seen to be true. Every all those Sitecore developers really love the platform. We want to share and help each other to, to learn and succeed, right? So, um, from our perspective, you know, we're not an agency, so we're not competing. Uh, we just want to learn in general, not necessarily for a competitive advantage, but to you know make make our stuff in house much better. Mm -hmm. So you know, at, and having been in agency world for the last nine, eight or nine years. You know, it's a, it's a big shift to think about it in a different way. You know, it's more for our own edification to pour into our our product, our websites. You know, so um, that's that's kind of an, a bunch of takeaways. Um, any any questions on on any of the stuff I talked about before I go into the demo? I guess my only one. I mean, the community you're you're, you're dead on, right? Um, you know, we, we've talked about it plenty of times in this show. We've talked about it with <coughs> everybody. How good the community really is. Are you finding that you're finding the materials that are you, are you seeing that you're finding materials that you need um, to go forward when you can't get a hold of the people part of it? Yeah, I mean, so some of the places and resources we we look a lot. Stack Overflow is huge. There's a lot of um, a lot of good stuff there, as you know, for for any any um, programming issue. Um, the Docs site has been helpful. Um, haven't spent as much time on uh, the docs.sitecore.net site 
because that kind of went sort of officially live um, when we were already kind of getting stuff moving. So we spent a lot of time on the on the Psycho Development Network, uh, pouring through documentation. Um, did notice and kind of had to take take it on faith that documents that said they were for Psycho like six five and up actually still apply to 7.5. So we try to, you know, at least for things that were guidelines for caching and stuff like that, shouldn't the concept shouldn't have changed really. So um, we'd have to read through that stuff and sort of learn for ourselves if it was actually, you know, still applicable. Mm -hmm. um, searching Google for, you know, any sort of posts we could find on a topic. Um, I had post, posted on multi-site uh, development and, and uh, some weird TDS encoding issues I ran into on my blog and randomly ran into my blog as a search result once, which was kind of always, <laughs> <laughs> that's always nice to see. And yes. I didn't realize it till I got there. I'm like, hey, this looks, oh, this is my site. Yep. Nice. Um, so a lot of Google searching. Okay. Um, and, you know, yeah, so that, that's kind of just a lot of searching on the internet, um, a lot of reading. Yeah. So just yeah. absorbing yep. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of places are your go-tos? Well, um, I was wondering just if you've used the community site and if that's been valuable to you, because that's a recent launch uh, three months ago, I believe. Yeah. So have you guys hit that <laughs> up, uh, being kind of the new the new SDN, if you will, or the, the new place to go? Um, I've gone there a few times for to look for documentation. Um, haven't been on it just to look around really yet. Um, we also have had, we've got also gone back and forth with Secor support on some issues. Um, but no, I mean that's that's definitely a site that um, it's on my radar since I know it's recently come out, and the SDN site points people to the new site yeah. often on there as well. So um, ha haven't had much experience with it yet, though. Okay, okay. So we've been loving it, and that's that's why we ask. I mean, we awesome. You know, we we eat and breathe this, right? Jamie, yeah. and I talk about this. We don't even talk about other things. We just talk about sidecar. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, we really don't, but we we like to say it that way. And uh, we're, we're just kind of curious. From your perspective, because you do have a different perspective than what we do, um, yeah. you know, if you're using the tools that are out there, what you think of them. I know we like them, <laughs> you know. So when you're going to look for information, when you're trying to put all this together, how how helpful are they in, in that scenario versus us trying to solve a problem uh, for more of a, a a lot of us have been have been doing this for a while, really. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of yeah. a different perspective. Sure. So, all right. Cool. Absolutely. So um, demo. Yeah, demo. So, <laughs> so, um, so my experience has been. Um, I started out as a back end developer, so and now I'm a front end developer. So I've done full stack for years. I started with you know PHP, MySQL, the LAMP stack. Okay. Done Cold Fusion, Perl. Um, you know, and to I've done classic ASP, which we all love, right? And yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's um, my fave. Oh, I know. So I, I and then you know um, web forms with C sharp done a little little VB uh, net more C sharp though and then into MVC so I've, I've been able to kind of see along the journey of all these different you know technologies and um, for f I've noticed that a lot of my friends who do kind of freelance work who are more back-end they either don't want to uh, contract a front-end designer like a developer and a designer to implement stuff so they try to do it themselves but and they know they want minification and all this, you know, these optimization things and the buzzwords they hear about, mm -hmm. but they don't really spend a lot of time with. Um, so, from my perspective, I think this is kind of kind of neat because once you get this set up, it's it's pretty cut and dry. You just have to learn a little bit of syntax for um, the, like SAS in particular, um, and it integrates in Visual Studio, which is even better. And that's one thing in the past that, whenever I started a, a solution um, up in Visual Studio. I'd have to remember to go to the to a command prompt and type like grunt watch or compass watch to fire off the the listeners for file changes. This integrates with your solution on open. It'll fire that off for you. So there's some really nice um, pieces there. Cool. Um, so specifically that part of it is um, there's the plugins that Task Runner Explorer kind of hooks into grunt and all of the different task uh, automated tasks and things we have there. Um, grunt launcher lets you run stuff from within Visual Studio. Um, so you'd install Node.js in, in Windows and Ruby in Windows, and then um, on um, Scott Hanselman's uh, site here, he has all these all the steps and instructions for installing things and getting it running. So <coughs> a quick overview. So we compile SAS into our CSS output. SAS is just uh, a codified way of writing C uh, CSS. 
uh, with a lot of reuse in mind, which is great. So it's got kind of a php -y kind of syntax look to it. So this brand green here is a dollar sign. It's a variable assigned to a hex value. We've got some body styles, and then we've got a div. And there's two things here. We're reusing the variable uh, in two places. As well, we have an ampersand prefix. So below the output, that spits it out um, with the color value where you're reusing it. And as well, you'll see there's div.myclass and div.another class. So there's different syntax um, patterns that you can follow um, to get reuse. You can also do looping, mix-ins, like sub, kind of sub-methods or functions. Um, you could do inheritance. So it's a super powerful framework for doing CSS development. Um, and it can make your files very, very small because you can reuse them. And if you change styling, you know, one color changes, you change it in one spot and it compiles and you're done. Mm -hmm. Additionally, JavaScript concatenation and minification, it'll combine, you give it a certain order in the grunt file in your configuration and it'll smash them all together in order. And that's what I'm going to show. Perfect. Um, again, and there are some resources here. Um, um, I have a very basic MVC site. It's just a, a empty site core instance in 7.5. Um, the sample layout is just pointing at, a, at this base layout CSHTML file. Okay. So it's just uh, one layout. So it's referencing what the final file is going to be, which that's the output, which is main.css. Um, and then the JavaScript file, body scripts, is a .min.js, which is a kind of a common pattern for minified files. Um, and that all ends up looking like this, you know, this super elegant web page. <laughs> um, um, so um, to start, we've got just two divs with classes on them mm -hmm. and content. Um, let's look at the CSS first. So here's um, the pattern I've followed and we follow at, uh, at Aurora is um, for multi-site instances in Sitecore, you want sites side by side in one instance. We have a sites folder, and then the name of the site, and then we have our structure of our, our files. So when we deploy, the project will deploy um, in the website folder for your Sitecore uh, install, um, a sites folder, and then your site. So they're all kind of namespaced by directory, so they keep, keep them nice and separate. Um, so our main SCSS file, um, is what I showed in, in, the, in the deck. So we got our variable up here, just some general styling, the prefix ampersand, which just outputs div dot, and then the class, and then reusing variables. Okay. Um, down, down at the bottom here, this is Task Runner Explorer. Um, so all of the tasks and things that this is showing here are defined in the Solution Explorer here in the grunt files. So this is the JSON file that defines all of our tasks. So we have a bunch of variables at the beginning here that you can reference these things in a JSON-like format, like path.dir.dev, for instance. Um, and so on top of Ruby, we've got the compass. So on command line, you would be typing, like you'd have Ruby installed, and you'd type compass space, and you'd pass it arguments. So this is just a representation of um, passing commands to it. And, th and then Grunt will just run this stuff for you once it's configured. So we provide things like our, our directory for, for where the SAS folders are, where the output CSS is, images, JavaScripts. And then you set up all of that stuff. And then at the very bottom, you define these groups of tasks. So um, this default task, which is what Task Runner um, is running currently, that will fire off a dev task, which is right down here. So it'll fire dev, which involves building scripts and then building styles, mm -hmm. which are defined here. And so it's just a bunch of like encapsulated steps. So the lowest level, it'll run um, the settings for the dev environment for compiling uh, our styles. And then we also additionally added a copy tool that copies them out to our inet pub folder locally for development so it speeds up that process so when we fire default it runs through all the css and javascript files does its magic and then runs watch which is the the file watcher so what you'll see in the css file here let me pin this back on so here it says waiting on uh, the bottom of this window if i make a change and say like 1M, I save, you'll see that it picks up the change. Mm -hmm. 
and then it's running the, the compass dev task, which runs all of those subtasks. And then it says uh, copied one file, and it's back to waiting. So if I refresh the page, it's, it's dropped the font size, so it recompiled it, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, so a lot of this is really configuration based, right? So it's, um, it could take some time to really figure it out and you gotta watch your syntax with JSON or else you know it, it won't work right. So um, there's a lot of helpful sites and documentation on, on how that's all set up. Um, so that's the SCSS piece. Okay. On the, on the JavaScript side, um, just for proof of concept, I've got three files here. Um, scripts, uh, well main, I'm just doing console logs of the file name, so console log main JS, scripts one, and scripts two. Um, and in the grunt file, I specify what files I want to include and in what order. Let's see, where are those? Here we go. Um, so for concatenation, I'm specifying this scripts body um, output of scripts one, scripts two, and then main JS. So we should see the console logs for scripts one, two, and main JS on the output, and it puts it in. Uh, a temporary folder of, for concatenation and then it runs minification after it and stuff. So you have these kind of interim um, files it's operating on to get the final output. So again we include that output file and when we look at the console you'll see scripts 1, scripts 2, and main JS. Um, so it combined them all into one file, so you got only have one HTTP request, which cuts down on, on load time overall. If you have a lot of files, that helps. Um, and if we looked at the CSS file, you'll see it's all, all minified. Hmm. Yep. Same for the JavaScript. So um, the hardest part of this, honestly, is the, is the configuration of it. So, you know... And that's setting like up the grunt file itself? Yes. Yeah, and there are examples um, for of of existing grunt files for different kinds of workflows. Um, and one of the things to note that um, even though this is integrated a kind of individual studio, you still have the manual installs of, of Node and Ruby on your on your dev machine um, separately before this will ever work. Mm -hmm. And then you and then you have some steps in that in that blog post from Scott Hanselman of um, you know having to run. Um, like in, you have to run um, some commands to install Grunt, for instance, on command line to make it globally available through your path settings in Windows um, for it to run from Visual Studio. Um, so it's probably for someone new to it, it's probably a couple of days of fooling around to kind of get used to how it all works um, and then be able to configure it and stuff. So it's, it's a little bit of a learning curve, um, but it's, it's a really nice benefit on, on the other side of it. So we've probably got in our main site, aurora.org, probably about 20, 20 or so script files um, in sort of um, as close to object-oriented JavaScript as you can get um, with encapsulation and stuff that are all being combined um, into, into one request in the body script. So um, it's one HTTP request, but we've got separate files for easier management mm -hmm. of things. Okay. Any qu any questions on on the any of that automation? No, it's pretty slick. Um, the variables can they cross files? The JavaScript ones or CSS? Uh, CSS either any, both really. Any, yes, any of them can. You might get um, warnings in the file that you're working in saying it can't find something. Mm -hmm. um, like let's say this color is uh, in another file brand uh, purple. It's gonna, you know, give you squiggly saying it's undeclared. Mm -hmm. But when the thing about Compass and why we pick Compass over um, one of the Grunt SAS compilers, um, it's a lot. It's pretty smart. It'll it'll look through all of your SAS files in the the direct the source directory that you pointed at. And um, what we did for our main site, so you can do include. So you'd have if it's in another file, you'd have like include actually import, um, and then your um, oh let's see it'd be. Scripts. Well, let's just say I don't know the path things right here, but sure. you'd have um, other file, and then if that file contained your brand purple, it would pull it in. Okay. Yep. So you just have to have references to the other things. Perfect. So that um, that concludes my talk. Um, let's see. 
you can f find me on LinkedIn if you have um, any questions or would like to set up you know times to talk about our experiences and get any help or I have a blog there as well um, that's it all right or only you guys have been up now for I want to say nine months is that right the team the team was built a year and a half ago so we had a, okay. whole, a whole new team whole new pro, uh, tooling process you know so we after we formed we had six months we redesigned the our website in mm -hmm. Sycor and um, got all of the processes in place so I mean it's it was a fast and furious it's a it's matured very quickly um, mm -hmm. to where you typically would start out at so very impressive very thank, impressive thank you. We, ha we have a great team. <laughs> so it's too bad you didn't have like a team picture you could hold up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, um, Jared, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. This was really good stuff. Um, definitely take advantage of, of Jared's offer to go check out the blog, to, to reach out. Um, you know, like I said, this is a very mature process that came up very quick. Uh, compared to other shops just starting out on Sitecore. Um, and it, it's actually pretty solid. While there's always room for improvement, and like you said, there's automation to happen that you guys are working on, you're working through things, um, you know, for for a year, year and a half, you guys are are, are, are in pretty good shape. So um, kudos to you guys. Thanks for saying so. Since you're closed, I say you're open. I got this this lovely from the community where everything else derives from these days 4,000 devs 4,000 devs in three months this is posted out here about the Nordic uh, Sitecore conference no they just we just had Sugcon Europe we're gonna have Sugcon North America probably in a month after this comes out yep and we have this in Sweden which I think is awesome so and I've noticed that, you know, now I'm I'm I, I've been um, uh, honored to be asked to help with the co-organization of the Milwaukee Cycle User Group. You used to be part of the Philadelphia Cycle User Group before you moved away. That's and left, correct. And left those guys high and dry, mind you. I put a replacement in there. They're doing all right. I'm sure they are. They're 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 good folks. A lot going on with conferences and SUGs and. I, you know, I'm thinking we probably need a site court dinner as well. A site court dinner. Now yeah. explain the concept. What are All you right. thinking? Are you there? familiar with the nerd dinner? I am not. Okay, well, you get a bunch of people that you would classify as nerds or who like to program stuff like site court. Okay. Not nerds are the most awesome people in the world. And you go have dinner. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about stuff, so, maybe a little presentation, but you essentially eat. So, so it's basically like a user group with dinner. Think about this. You grab a bunch of people, you go grab some food, you shove it down your throat, and you talk Sitecore. That would be a Sitecore dinner. Okay. That sounds wonderful for the people in Boston and Chicago and maybe Philly maybe Northern California, maybe even L.A. Mm -hmm. What do the people like myself who are in a area that, you know, doesn't seem to be the hotbed of Sitecore devs do? Are you going to pay for me to fly there to oh, dude. have dinner? No, because all we're going to have is like a shamrock shake and a cheeseburger. I mean, you know, I mean, you I eat, like vanilla you've eaten with me. You know? I never eat nice. And you've eaten with me, and you know my habits. <laughs> so, no, I would not play for your pay for your plane ticket. Play for your pain ticket <laughs> to nerd dinner, site core style, right? However, now we're seeing a lot more video. I think that with video, and I think when conferencing gets a little bit better. Now we use Skype to do our jibber jabber. Right? And yes. with guests, right? Yes. You're giving away our technical secret. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's such a technical secret when it actually says the word Skype on the first few episodes. So, and you can tell, oh, I've never used Skype before. What is this strange, strange tool? 
we can we can honestly say though that Skype is not without its faults in conferencing. Correct. So, and we've I think we've hit almost every fault. This is why I got to go change my internet connection in the basement every time we do a podcast. That being said, it's the only technology we found that works. Very true. As the tools get a little bit better, right? As things come out, I I think there need I, I first of all I think there's a need for people to not just have Tinder together, but I think there needs to be a little bit more casual conversation. The SUGs are great, right? But it is hard to find speakers. We yes. believe it or not, as popular with the five or ten people that watch this, we tend to have some problems with people wanting to come on and speak. It's very intimidating. You're intimidating. No, I'm not. Friendly. I'm short. You're gigantic. Well, I'm gigantic because I don't know why. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Yeah, I mean... I'm <laughs> My mom sure. says I'm a catch. <laughs> I, I'll <laughs> certainly give it to you in terms of um, sometimes at, at user groups... Sometimes you want to go because you want to sit and digest an expert's point of view. Or mm-hmm. someone, maybe if they're not even an expert, someone who has a different point of view or a different experience than you. And you just want to sit and, you know, digest. Mm-hmm. There's other times when you want to have an actual conversation and say, hey, this is what I've got going on. And it's certainly not enough for a presentation, but let's talk a few minutes about it and see if there's other approaches people could recommend me, right? So yeah. I could see that in sort of more of a casual setting for a dinner. Um, I could see that. I just think you're going to struggle to find people in the same region. Like, you and I might think this is a great idea, but we live so many miles apart, we ain't having dinner together. Well, and I know some of the MVPs in Boston, and I know one of them, or a couple of them, actually uh, tweeted out pictures. Um, they had a visitor. Yes. Um, actually, I went out there, and I think Tim, um, Mark, and Dan all went out, and they were, they were having, I think, drinks and dinner. I mean, I think you can go back to, to episode one of our own podcast. We... Cam was our our guest, right? Mm -hmm. We basically met Cam. We met him a little after dinner, you know. I mean, I don't (laughs) I don't want to say met met, in like we met Cam in a drunken stupor. (laughs) One of us was. Um, It wasn't me, by the way. Um, And you know, that was probably the genesis of being able to have Cam be that initial guest. So there's certainly, you know, even if you aren't talking Sitecore, that sort of camaraderie you can build Mm -hmm. is always beneficial when you then start adding people to your IM lists and, you know, you have a problem and you're like, oh, but I bet this person's probably faced this. And yeah, you have a great point about getting together. The community is really good about that. Um, and I think, I think there needs to be a little bit more in a different format. Listen, there's a lot of SUGs, right? There's a lot of user groups. A lot of them are active. There are just as many that maybe are a bit dormant. Because, you know, finding speakers or, or whatever the case may be, right? Um, yeah, so I can speak... I mean, I co-founded the Philadelphia Users Group, and and when that came about, we did it in conjunction with um, Sitecore. Not that they were really officially part of it, but we certainly communicated with them, said we had interest in doing this, got some of their feedback um, and did it with their blessings and you know one of the things they said was well our data shows you need X amount of user base in an area to get this successful so in terms of things going dormant or whatnot it may be because in that particular area it's hard to find users and I understand that Um, I also understand sometimes it's hard. You're working with usually a limited budget, and it can be hard to find locations. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you've already mentioned, speakers can sometimes be a problem. Maybe what some user groups who could be struggling to find 
locations and or speakers should think about is throwing in a dinner and sort of a more low-key ad hoc hey let's just kind of have a round table and discussion and you know very casual yeah um i appreciate Sudcons. i appreciate you know the developer conference in sweden even though i i won't be attending i appreciate these things go on i appreciate the user groups i just think being presented to you lose something mm-hmm. having the dialogue get something now if somebody wants to have dinner with me, those poor suckers, I'll do it. Right? Especially if they're buying, dude. I'm I'm all over that. <laughs> but, no, I, I think it's a good thing. I think there needs to be a little bit more collaboration. We're, we're very lucky when we have guests on that we have time to talk to them kind of off air, yes. if you will, right? So we get yes, to know people a little bit better. Yes, and I pick all their brains. Yeah, I mean, well, and, and they say some really great crap that we just can't put on the podcast. Yes. We just talked about one before in between our segments, which was yep. awesome. We should put that on a t-shirt. Anyway, <laughs> the point being is I, I think when you get to know the people a little bit better, when you can kind of get the more cross-integration of people's thoughts versus kind of in a room soaking it in, I think it's just a little bit better. I don't know how you accommodate that in, conf- well, conferences. I know how you accommodate that, right? And I think that happens with like things like bird of a feather sessions, which is kind of like people getting around in a circle, telling everybody about their problems. Oh wait, that's mm-hmm. that's something different, but it's like that. And <laughs> and you know, so conferences kind of facilitate that. We at symposium, they had the nice little lounge area, right, that people mm-hmm. could bump into each other and try to run across. Conferences are expensive, though, and and in a certain location, and require travel, and Mm -hmm. I think you're looking at something a little more organic, popping up everywhere, right? Yeah, everything should be free. We've learned that from the internet and music, from Napster. (laughs) Everything should be free. No, there's a cost. Turn away, Metallica. Turn (laughs) away. (laughs) Everything has a price, and and yes, there's organization costs to everything that you're going to do, you know, right? Money's got to come from somewhere for, for a little bit. But, yeah, you're right. Conferences can be pretty costly. Um, even the one-day in-town things have a fee usually to them. Mm-hmm. So, organically seems to be the best route. But if you're not together, how do you organize? Yeah, I don't know. But all I will... So I was getting at a point that you totally f- took in a different I know. direction. That's because you volunteered uh, me to pay for dinner or something like well, that. Well, that was the point I was trying to get to. I was going to say that I thought I heard you saying, you know, people in Milwaukee could message you and say, hey, that sounds great, I'd be interested. And then I was going to follow that by saying anyone who finds themselves in San Diego or the nearby areas could certainly hit me up on Twitter Mm -hmm. and if there's people who have interest in said dinner we could get it organized you know let's do that let's let's make a commitment right here if you have a dinner I'll hold one even if it's with myself (laughs) I will hold a dinner I can commit to eating dinner (laughs) yes with with another person (laughs) if that person out there exists done (laughs) Yeah, no, I think it's good. I think maybe that maybe that's the start of a next step. So let, let's do this. All ten of you people watching right now. If you happen to be in Milwaukee or San Diego. No, no. Ten people watching. Wherever you may be. Seattle, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, Milwaukee, San Diego, Oklahoma, Maine, Montana, Puerto Rico. Costa Rica, wherever. Europe. Should I just keep going? No, let's right. get to the end. Um, let's see. Let's see if this works. Let's try some things out. I mean, there's already organizers of. of it's another opportunity to reach out to the community. Yeah, you know, try try a dinner for once a month. You know. So what's uh? 
The hashtag is Sitecore Scrum, right? Who started that? I think that was Reynolds, or at least he's doing Reynolds. it every day. So maybe, maybe anyone who is listening, all five or ten of you, maybe post a tweet out there with hashtag Sitecore Dinner. Let's do that. Hashtag Sitecore Dinner. Let's talk about it every day on Sitecore Scrum till this episode comes out to create awareness to our cause. Okay. We we need a five hundred one C organization. You're gonna force me to use Twitter now. Somebody's got to. <laughs> Every morning we'll talk about Sitecore dinner, except for the weekends, man. I got I got stuff. I'll be mixing this on the weekend. Is what I'll be doing. Yes. And I say let's uh let's uh let's try everyone to get one going. I'll start. All right. I don't care. I'll start. I'll do it in my. Life. I don't want to pay for meetup though, man. That, that then I gotta get sponsorships and. You know what I mean? All right. It's a lot of work. Yes. That's a lot on my plate, Jamie. I understand. Bond I've back. been a co-organizer or co-founder. I understand. And you've already we- got co-organization. So... Well, yes. that's because they let me in because... I don't know why. But <laughs> pretty? I'm not sure. But, you know, we gotta we got to do sponsors next year for this, right? So, for me to sponsor a dinner so somebody can feed me my escargot... Well, I think I don't know are you really saying you think somebody should specifically pay for dinner for me just me no here's what I think should happen I think somebody sets it up I don't know how we're going to communicate this maybe through the current conferences I like to see everybody try it for a little while see if it works see if it sticks I I think everything that's out there is great. I love the virtual user group, right? I like mm-hmm. what people are doing. I'm, I'm happy to see that LA is going to be possibly doing video. Hopefully they record it and they post it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I really think that's what user groups are going to go. I don't think it's going to be a city locale anymore. I think we're going to have to do this just because of people, travel, regions, all sorts of stuff. Yep. But it would be good for people to get together. I know Boston. I know those guys hang out. You know, I don't know how often. I don't know what their schedule is. They don't tell me because they're afraid I'm going to show up. <laughs> is what that is. So they do that in secret, or at least it's a don't tell Mark that we're having dinner. And um, I think I think it'd be nice to do that in other other parts. Just to once a month meet at a place, rotate the place, do whatever. All right. Hashtag Sitecore Dinner. Let's make it happen. Yep. And let's start tomorrow when nobody knows what we're talking about because they won't see this because I'm not going to do it that quick. <laughs> and we'll go from there. And there's right. a lot of editing to do in here, but it's funny as hell. <laughs> uh, well, until next time, don't forget to publish. <laughs>